just a just just a little while longer. Growing up, I remember hearing a song that said, I believe I'll just run on and just just see what the end's going to be. I might as well finish. Like, I don't believe he brought me this far just to leave me. I might as well. I might as well stick in there. I believe he's got something amazing on the other side of this. How y'all doing tonight, church? Y'all doing good? Do y'all feel as good as you look? Do you feel as good as your worship sounds? Good. Good, good. I am, uh, I gotta, I'll be honest with you guys, I'm uh, a little, a little, a lot of bit nervous to be up here. Uh, I've not preached in quite a while, so uh, with your talking back to me, with your prayers and your support, I think we'll both get through this uh, unscathed tonight, amen? So, we are in uh, the fourth week of our series, Ships. We're talking about how discipleship informs and it should be the foundation of every relationship we're in. Tonight, my belief is that God gives us friendships to help us manage life. We're talking about friendships tonight. Somebody say friendships. Friendships. Y'all said it like y'all ain't got no friends. Say friendships. Friendships. There we go. I believe God gives us friendships to help us manage life. And when we live our lives as friends of God and invest in godly friendships, I believe that we strengthen our ability to live our lives in a way that would point others to him and bring him glory. And if at any point in this message you realize that you've not necessarily been living your life as a friend of God, at the end of this message, we'd like the opportunity to pray with you. If at any point in this message you realize that the way you view friendships may have been damaged by old experiences, we'd like to pray with you as well. But tonight, we're talking about friendship. Somebody say that again. Say friendship. Friendship. Yeah, if you're watching online, put it in the chat. Friendships. And as we dive into this study of what biblical friendship looks like, we come across the Greek word philia. Somebody say philia. Philia. Yeah, that means friendship or brotherly love. Philia. And there's a lot of different tenses of this word. You you get phileos, you get uh, uh, Philadelphia. Uh, I like to think of phileia as the, I, the way I remember how to say it is, I think of the place of brotherly love, chick phileia. Hey Amen. Somebody, somebody just got real hungry. That word simply means friendship or brotherly love. We see some examples of this in Proverbs 17, 17. The, the, the word says, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for a time of adversity. What this scripture is telling us here is that hard times have the tendency to reveal who your real friends are. You ever been through a situation that was so challenging and then when you tried to call that person you thought was your friend, all of a sudden, they just don't pick up no more. It's like you you might get one off like, hey bro, let me tell you what's going on with me, man. I, I, I need prayer, I got this happening. And then after that, it's like, poof. Thought you was my friend. Proverbs says that heart, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. You find out who your real friends are when it's time for a fight. The person that's like, no, 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 let me get them. That's, that's probably one of your real friends there. I try to keep one or two of those in the back pocket just in case something goes left. You know, I can stay out of trouble. But Romans 12, 9 and 10 says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. What, it, what the scripture is telling us here is that real friends are loving, they're honest, they're loyal, they're respectful, and they generally want what's best for you. Like, and not just what you want or you think is best for you, like what God's best for you is. Because if you're honest, like me, sometimes what I want for me and what God wants for me are two different things. I don't, I, don't, I don't particularly like those friends that say like, oh, I just want you to be happy. Whatever it takes, I just, I just want you to be happy. Are you happy? Well, then follow your heart. No, 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 because I've been happy making some very dumb decisions. And I need somebody who loves me enough to say, hey, bro, I know you happy, but that's dumb. Hey, bro, I know you happy, but don't buy that car. Uh Uh-uh, don't do it. Uh Uh-uh, don't date that person. Uh, no, 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 you don't need to take that job. Nope, I know that would probably make you happy, but that's not God's best for you. And Proverbs 27 says that that the wounds of a friend are faithful, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. I like the way the Passion Translation says, you can trust a friend who wounds you with his honesty, 
but your enemies pretend, pretended flattery comes from insincerity. I would rather a friend that will hurt my feelings but will tell me the truth over somebody who's just going to say what they think I want them to hear. And then tomorrow I'm like, bro, I need you to pray for me because I done got myself into some stuff that had you just, and then they're like, well, yeah, man, I was wondering what you was, what you was doing, you know, because I thought that was dumb when you said it, but I didn't want to say nothing because you seem really invested. And no, 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 I need somebody who will hurt my feelings today to help my future tomorrow. The scripture says that's the type of friend you can trust. We talking about friends tonight. Somebody say friends. Yeah, say it again. Friends. How many of us have them? Friends. Ones you can depend on. Friends. Before we go any further, let's be friends. Before we go on another vacation, let's be friends. Before we sign a lease, let's be friends. Before we go down the aisle, let's be friends. Before we sit next to each other in church, let ho, oh, oh, I need... Are we friends? Are we cool? Are you going to be honest with me? What's happening here? I need to know what kind of person I'm sitting next to. Before we go any further, let's be friends. And as we look at that word philea, Aristotle, he kind of said that he kind of broke these off into three different sections. And I, I renamed them because I didn't like the way he said it, to be honest. But he said, you've got friends for a reason, friends for a season, and then friends you just squeeze in. I say it again. You got friends for a reason, friends for a season, and then friends you just squeeze in. Tell you what I mean. Friends you just squeeze in, those are the type of people that you don't really have a whole lot in common, but you're typically united by a common problem or proximity. We see this demonstrated in shows like Gilligan's Island. They, would, they probably would have never been friends had they not got stuck on that island. Superstore, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, The Office. Those are the type of relationships that says, we're cool because I'm here, but like, when I leave, I'm going to hang out with my real friends. And you know it because you're watching this group of people all day like, I can't wait to get home and tell my real friends this mess here. <laughs> it's like, as soon as I leave this door, I've left your life. We are not friends out of here. You don't need my phone number. You don't need my home address for nothing. Like, as soon as we get past here at 5 o'clock, you can forget you know me, fam. Like. Those are the type of friends you squeeze in. You don't really make a whole lot of room in your life for them. And you're going to get a whole lot of those. That's going to be probably your most populated category. If you go through your phone right now, it's probably full of those folks. The next, you got friends for a season. These are people who are united by a common pleasure or passion. You see this in shows like Saved by the Bell, Different World, Grownish. Recess. This is the type of people that says, as long as we like the same stuff, we're cool. As long as we like the same friends, we cool. As long as we hang out at the same places, we cool. As long as we got class together, we cool. As long as we go to church together, we cool. But the second that changes, I'm out. We good. We was cool for a season. And that's okay. It's, good to have, it's okay to have those types of friends because they help you grow. They do help you build. And you'll actually have quite a bit of those as well. And there should be a graduation in some friendships, if we could be honest. Some friends that you had yesterday, they just don't serve the same purpose in life anymore. And it's heartbreaking when you find out that these ain't the type of friends that's going to be around forever. Because it was fun when we had class every day. But it's summer break. I'm not going to see you. And then I get back and it's like, who are you again? I Oh, yeah, we had math together. It's okay. It's okay to graduate from some friendships. But here's the most valuable type of friend. These are the friends for a reason. These are the type of friends that are united by common principles. I'm here for a reason. I'm not going anywhere. I'm committed to you no matter what. We could change jobs. We could change churches. We could change relationships. It does, none of that matters because I'm never leaving your life. We see this in, in, in shows like Seinfeld, Martin, Friends, New Girl, Living Single, and one of my personal favorites, The Golden Girls. Any Golden Girls fans in here? Yo, these are the type of friends that when you get through a heavy season in life, you look at them and you say, thank you for being a friend. 
Doom, 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 doom. Travel down the road and back again. Ba -na -na -na. True, you're a pal and a confidant. Now, all the real show watchers know this part right here. You'll say, and if you threw a party, yeah, and invited everyone you knew. I'm recruiting for the worship team, y'all. You would see the biggest gift would be from me. And the card attached would say, thank you for being a ba 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 I do that every time I watch that show, too. Like, every single time. It could be 3 in the morning, and my wife is sleeping. I'm over there. But you might be listening, and you might say, Cool, that sounds good. Great, friends, who needs them? I've got my cat, I've got Jesus. That's all I need. Y'all laugh, but some people really live that way. Can I encourage you and let you know that God had friends? Yeah, God had friends. James 2.23, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. Because he could believe and trust in the character of God, because his faith was never unwavering. Like, whatever God told him to do, he said, God, I'm here. Whatever you ask of me, I got it. You got undying, unwavering, unquestionable loyalty from me. And God said, we can be friends, because I'm that same way. Can I let you know that Jesus had friends? The disciples. In John 15, 15, Jesus looks at the disciples and says, I no longer call you servants. Because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. I love this demonstration right here. Jesus says, I no longer call you a servant. I call you friend because I can trust you with my father's business. Since the early age of 12, every time we see Jesus, he's, I'm about my father's business. I'm about my father's business. I'm about my father's business. And so clearly his father's business meant a lot to him. And so what he says to the disciples is, is I call you friends because I can trust you with what's important to me. And the way I evaluate if I can trust you with what's important to me is how you handle what's important to you. If you out here telling all of your business, trust me, you won't have any of mine to share. If you're not being a good steward of your money, you don't have to worry about me loaning you anything. If you're not a good steward of your time or your car or your resources or the things that hold value and substance in your life, your family, your job, your relationships, if the things that should matter to you seem to just be handled recklessly, I'm going to do you a favor <laughs> and not, you don't got to worry about my stuff. I, I, I'm cool. I got this. Jesus says, everything I learned from my father, I share with you. And when you're in a really, really, really good friendship, everything you learn about the father, you'll want to share with them. Yo, let me show you what the Lord showed me in this scripture today. Let me show you how the Lord is, is loving me through this bad habit and this bad cycle I've got. Let me tell you everything I possibly know about the father. Those are the types of friends I want. Who can call me randomly in the middle of the afternoon and say, hey, man, what you doing? Nothing. Great. Hey, look, I was reading this scripture, and I love it when that happens. When my friends call me with scriptures and prayers and, cool, bro, thank you. I appreciate it because it builds me up and it edifies me because I might not be having a great day. But when you have a friend that can constantly remind you of the goodness and the character of God, that's a friend worth holding on to. What kind of friends do you have? Or could I ask the question, what kind of friend are you? Because it's really, really, really easy to listen to a message like this and start applying these heavy filters to all of our friendships. Like, oop, you ain't, uh-uh, mm, nope, nope, not going to call you no more. But what if there's somebody on the other end of the phone that might be feeling the same way about us? What kind of friend am I being? Am I being the type of friend that Jesus would be proud to call a friend? And the good thing is when you, have, when you have friends, three things happen. Now, looking through scripture, y'all, I will be honest with you. I got completely overwhelmed at the amount of scripture there is about friendships. Like Psalms, 
Proverbs, all in the New Testament. It's all types of scriptures about what a friend does, what a friend doesn't do, brotherly love this, brotherly love that. And there was no way in the world I could fit that all into a 30-minute message. And I only got about 19 minutes left. And so if you have questions, if you have dialogue, if you have something you want to put in, if you have something you want to ask, if you're seeking clarity, or if you're seeking new friends, can I invite you to be my personal guest at Can We Talk this Wednesday? (laughs) Smells like a plug, doesn't it? That's a plug, ain't it? This Wednesday night at 6.30 right here in this sanctuary, we'll be having what we call Can We Talk? And all we do is we simply dive into some dialogue about this past weekend's message. So if you got questions, comments, snide remarks, please text Can We Talk? One word, no spaces, to 97,000. That's Can We Talk? One word, no spaces, to 97,000. That's Can We Talk? One word, no spaces to 97,000, and we would love to continue this dialogue with you this Wednesday. Amen? So, the first thing I observe is that friends help shape who we become. Proverbs 13, 20, uh, I'm going to read it in the NIV and the message. It says, walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. The message translation says, become wise by walking with the wise. Hang out with fools and watch your life fall into pieces. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Easier said if you lie down with dogs. Whoever you give influence to in your life is who you give your image to. If Pastor James were here, he would say, we become what we behold. Before I got into full-time ministry, before I, uh, I stepped out into vocational ministry, I was um, a wardrobe consultant at Men's Warehouse. And so I wore suits for seven years every day, right? That was, that was my life for seven long years. And when you're wearing suits and shirts and ties every day, you got to have a good relationship with your tailor because they're the ones that's really making you look good. Like, you know how it is. If you buy a good outfit, if it don't fit right, it's still trash. So... I worked at the Newport News store, and over in Virginia Beach, there was this really cool guy named Hal. Hal was a tailor. Hal was what you would call an OG. He was a professional tailor. He had been doing it all his life. He was an older black guy, had long dreads. He was super cool. He knew how to do everything by the book. He had tricks that wasn't even in the book. Like, you could take something to him and say, ain't no way in the world I'm getting these in these jeans ever again. And he found a way to get you in them. Like, with miracle signs and wonders and a little Crisco, he would get you back into it. And Hal was really, really cool. Just a really good guy, right? He was one of those types of guys that had a little cadence in his talk, had a little cadence in his walk. You know, one of them old people that said a whole lot but never really said anything at all. You ask him, how you doing, man? Man, if I had two nickels, I still couldn't call it. (laughs) Hey, man, we running out for lunch. You want Chick-fil-A or Buffalo Wild Wings? Any way the wind blows, still cool me off. Is that Chick-fil-A or? (laughs) You know those type of people, right? But Hal was cool because every now and again, he would drop some goodness in there. And so something happened with one of our tailors, and Hal had to come over and work in our store for for a whole week. And I was excited. I'm like, yes, I get to spend a week with Hal. This is going to be great. So the first day Hal comes in, he's, what's going on, young blood? What's going on, young blood? How you doing, man? How you doing, cool breeze? You doing all right? I said, yeah, Hal, I'm doing good. And every moment I had that week, I was back there with Hal. We was kicking it. We was talking. We was hanging out. We was best friends for the week. And I didn't realize that by the end of the week, I was talking smooth and slow like Hal. I was walking with a limp like Hal. I had it until one of my friends that really knew me said, hey, bro, what's going on with your legs? That's nothing, man. I'm cool, man. I'm cool. You know, what's happening? He said, you don't usually walk like that. What's going on? And then I realized what happened to me. See, when Hal was young, he, in, he actually experienced an injury that caused him to walk with a limp. And from the outside looking in, it just seemed like his personality because, you know, he kind of worked it in. He was smooth. But what I didn't realize was that I picked up a handicap that didn't belong to me. 
And sometimes relationships are the same way. Sometimes we get in relationships and you pick up anxiety that's not yours. You pick up hurt that's not yours. You pick up fear that's not yours. And it takes a real friend to say, hey, 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 put that down. That don't belong to you. That's not yours. Anxiety is not yours. Fear is not yours. Depression is not yours. Ah, ah, put that down. Ah, put that down. That ain't you. It's not yours. I messed around and I gave Hal all the influence and I gave Hal my image. I was <laughs> scooting and didn't even know why. The next thing that happens in friendships is that friends help us shoulder our burdens. Proverbs 18.24 says, one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. But, somebody say but. There is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And I got really encouraged this weekend because I've heard this scripture quoted, preached, sung all of my life. And they always talk about Jesus when they're saying this, right? He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother, which is true. But it doesn't say Jesus' name in that scripture, which lets me know that that is a healthy expectation that I could have for earthly relationships. And I can also be that kind of friend. I knew I wouldn't get no emails on that one. That's the type of word that grows you up a little bit, challenges you in your, in your relationships. I don't want to be an unreliable friend. I don't want to have unreliable friends. We see a picture of this happening in Matthew 26 with Jesus, Peter, James, and John. Now, Jesus is in the middle of one of the worst experiences he could have ever experienced on earth. He's getting ready to go to the cross. He's getting ready to go to Calvary and be whipped beyond recognition and lay down his life for our sins. And he knew this is really about to be uncomfortable. This is a really heavy assignment. And so he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying and he's saying, Lord, if you just get me out of this one, we cool. If there's any other way, I could not have to do this. I would greatly appreciate it. And all he did was ask Peter, James, and John just to be there and pray with him. He didn't say, hey, man, when the Roman soldiers come, I'm going to need you to fight off a couple of them. Or, you know, if he hit me, like, you come in and do this thing. Or can you, can you carry my cross for me? Or can y'all, you know, put down some pillow mints in the tomb or something? Like, he didn't ask them for any of that. He just said, I just need you to pray with me. I don't need you to carry it for me. I just need you to pray with me as I'm going through it. And what were them jokers doing? They were asleep. Now, if you rewind nine chapters to Matthew 17, Jesus is on the mountain of transfiguration. And he's there with Moses and Elijah. And the glory of the Lord was so revealed, Jesus' very appearance changed. And the glory is revealed, and Moses is there, and Elijah's there, and there's this whole great thing. And, and Peter runs up, and James and John are there too. And Peter's like, man, it's so good we're here. Like, should we build tents? Like, man, this is awesome. And God speaks and is like, sit down, Peter. Like, just chill out. And now here it is nine chapters later. Now that the glory is lifted and we're in the garden, they're asleep. When the trouble came, they were asleep. I don't know about you, but I need friends who can handle my glory as well as my garden. Don't dance with me on the mountaintop if you can't pray with me in the garden. I need so Jesus said, I need somebody who can handle my divinity as well as my humanity. I need somebody who can appreciate the anointing on my life, but also pull my coattails and be like, hey, bro, you tripping. You, I can tell you ain't prayed today. My wife does it faithfully. 1045, her hands are lifted in worship. And at 11 o'clock, she's like, hey, bro, you got to take that trash out or something. <laughs> Do you have somebody who can be with you when you're up and with, with you when you're down? In good times and bad times, can you stand the rain? Sunny days. Everybody loves them. I want to know, can you stand the rain? And the last thing is that friends help share our blessings. In Luke 5, 
this really cool story. Jesus just finished preaching. Um, and we pick it up in verse 4. It says, when Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now, I, here's where I would have started asking questions. Because, like, why is a professional fisherman taking fishing advice from a carpenter? <laughs> just, just doesn't make sense to me. You don't have any experience doing what I do, Jesus. What, what are you talking about? Let down my nets. I've been fishing all night. I haven't caught anything. Which is exactly what Peter says in a way. He says, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. I want to pause right here and say that the cool thing that it happened right here is that Peter recognized who was speaking and not just what he was saying. That he recognized that Jesus had a revelation beyond his experience. And sometimes our friends will do that. God will give them a word. He'll give them a, a, some wisdom to share with us. And they may not have any experience in what we're going through, but because who said it, I can trust it. In verse 6, it says, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled their boats so full that they began to sink. Peter had such an overflow of blessing that he couldn't hold it all himself. He had to call over his friends to do it. And when I think about people who live that way, I think about Miss Raquel that goes to this church. I don't, some of y'all must be friends with her because y'all are clapping. She is the only person I know who would be like, yeah, I was down at the Costco. They had refrigerators on sale for 15 cents. I bought nine of them. Do you know anybody who needs a fridge? I bought a whole container of jeans for $62. <laughs> 50 pairs of jeans in here. Anybody need some denim? You a size two? What size are you? I bring them to the house. She done hit me up with a couple of them care baskets. Like, she done showed up at the house with detergent and toothpaste and soap and mouthwash. I'm like, you trying to say I stink? She's like, no, I just had extra. I just cannot share some of this with you. We should have friends that call you every now and again and say, I got some overflow. Can I share it with you? I've got some goodness, can I share it with you? I've got some fruit of the spirit, can I share it with you? I got a little extra love, can I share it with you? I got a little extra joy, can I share it with you? I got a little bit of extra peace, can I share it with you? Do you have any friends in your life that can share the fruit of the spirit with you? Got a little extra healing, you need some of this? Got a little extra goodness and self-control, gentleness, faithfulness. Can I, can I share some of this with you? Because we all pray for exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think and press down, shaking together, running over. But where is it going to go? You need somebody to bless with it. And what better person than your friends? After this moment, Peter got promoted. Jesus said, I will, I'm calling you to not only be a fisher of fish, but a fisher of men. Peter got promoted, but he took James and John with him. James and John got promoted because of Peter's obedience. Jen says it all the time. I love when she says it. She says, when the tide rises, all the boats flow higher. When my friends get blessed, that's good. I should celebrate that because that means God is still in the blessing business. When my friends get healed, I pray in earnest expectation because he's still in the healing business. I used to hear it when I was growing up. They say, if God bless your neighbor, you ought to praise him because that means he's in the neighborhood. And that's just so encouraging when I see everybody else getting theirs and, you know, everybody else is singing, I am standing on it. I'm still standing and waiting on it. I should celebrate with them because if God is doing it for one, he'll do it for all of us. And your friends encourage you and help you build up your faith until your time comes. And this, this is the moment where you may have been listening and this is, this is the part of every message. Every message has it. This is, I call this the great buts of every message. It's when you listen to the message and you say, great, but you don't know my story. Great, but you don't know my experience. Great, but I have a hard time making friends. I was reading an article uh, on, a re on some research done by Psychology Today. They did a study in Greece and in Cyprus of about 650 people. And I thought the results of this uh, research were, uh, I, I really thought it was good. They found that of those 650 people, they asked them, what are your challenges making friends? What's holding you up? What's blocking you? What's, what's keeping you from taking that next step and in investing in relationship? 
And they kind of took all of this and they put it into six different buckets. The first one is low trust. Just don't trust nobody. I've had my heart broken before. I've been betrayed. I've been lied to. I've been lied on. And I'm just not interested in taking that next step. Next one is lack of time. I work two jobs and I coach Little League and I serve on the weekends. When am I going to find time for friends? Bills do. I got to make these ends meet play. I got to get this bag. When am I going to have time? Friends? Who got time for friends? The next one is my bucket, introversion. I'm cool. I don't need a whole lot of people. God bless you from a distance. The next one is rejection of others. Just picky. Uh, teeth crooked. Nah, we good. Uh, they don't have a degree. I'm good. Uh, I'm only friends with business owners. Uh, I'm good. Just picky. Just rejection of others. The next one is fear of being rejected. What if they don't like me? What if I tell them my secrets and bare my soul to them? Are they going to judge me? Are they going to look at me different because I've got some real life experiences? And then the last one is actual pragmatic reasons. These are for people who may be uh, physically or mentally handicapped, those who may be diagnosed with social disorders and just can't, just, just literally just can't make friends. And I was kind of talking about this and thinking about it and praying about it, and I talked to a great, great theologian, my wife. <laughs> and uh, she said, just casually, just dropping gems as she always does, she says, I bet if we looked at the life and ministry of Jesus, I bet he interacted and fixed all of those. <laughs> Say less. Let me take a look. So as I looked at how Jesus dealt with low trust in John 13, 5, Jesus knew Judas would betray him. And he still chose to wash Jesus's wash Judas's feet. When it came to having a lack of time. John 7, Jesus knew his time was short, so he never wasted a single moment. He was always about his father's business. Jesus was an introvert like me, and so in Luke 5, 16, we see that Jesus often went into the wilderness to pray. He went away, had his quiet time, and he used that as an opportunity to recharge and refuel so he can be invested back in the healthy community. Dealing with the rejection of others. Jesus drew close to the sinners and the outcasts. We see that in Luke 15 and 2. There was nobody who Jesus wouldn't kick it with. When it came to the fear of being rejected, Jesus knew Peter would deny him, but still trusted him with his sheep. In fact, Peter was the same one that Jesus said, you're going to be the guy I'm going to build my church on. I wouldn't build anything on anybody I think is going to betray me. As soon as I get a, a, a whiff of betrayal, you out the group chat, player, we don't, we good. This, <laughs> that's the line. And then when it came to pragmatic reasons, I, I, I struggled with this one a little bit. And then I remember the story of Legion. We find that in Mark 5, 18 and 20. And the interesting thing about Legion is uh, by today's standards, Legion had what would, would probably be some very strongly medically diagnosed disorders. And he lived by himself. He lived out in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, um, in a cemetery. No friends, no community, no relationship. Everybody looked at him from afar, but nobody would embrace him. Nobody would engage him. And so after his encounter with Jesus, he was freed, he was delivered, he was restored back to his right mind, and he wanted to actually follow Jesus. The story says that he says, Master, let me go with you. And Jesus said, no, I, wanted, I want you to stay here so I can restore you back to community so you can tell the testimony of what I've done for you. When people get close to you and they know your story, they should see the story of a transformed heart. They should see the testimony of Jesus. Can we all stand? I want to invite the band out. This past Wednesday night, Hillary said something really, really cool, and it, it really really inspired me and it, it stuck with me all week. We were talking about uh, how to deal with trauma and you know dealing with past hurts and um, she said yes while I recommend therapy and I, I, I recommend going to see a guidance counselor I recommend all of that. Sometimes God chooses to heal us through relationships. Sometimes it'll come 
in the form of friendship. I didn't know I could be healed from the fear of betrayal until I had the right friend. I didn't know I could be healed of insecurity until I had the right friend that built me up. If at any point you've realized tonight that you could benefit from having more God-centered friendships, would you please join us this Wednesday at Can We Talk? If at any point in this message you realize that you've not been living your life as a friend of God, we want to pray with you. How do you become a friend of God? Abraham became a friend of God because he believed him. Romans 10.9 says that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so when you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, the Bible tells us that we become the righteousness of God. And that's how we become friends with him, through our confession of belief. If at any point in this message you have realized that the way you view relationships has been damaged by old experiences, we want to pray with you as well. I want to take this moment to invite the prayer partners down. And if you're one here that, or watching online that says, I haven't really accepted my friendship with Jesus. And today I want to, I want to try it. I, I just want to try it. I might not get it always right. I might not, you know, I might need some help figuring this thing out, but I want to, I want to, today I want to be day one of my journey of friendship with Jesus. Would you just do something courageous and just slip up a hand real high so we can see you. Even if you're watching online, we've got somebody ready to pray with you and connect with you. If you just say, I want today, I want to begin my journey of friendship with Jesus. Take our time here. I don't want this moment to pass. Because real friends wait on their friends. And I don't see any hands on in, in, in house, but if you're one online, he loves you so much. And he actually wants to be your friend. Would you click that button? And we've got somebody standing by who wants to pray with you. And if you're here and maybe you just didn't have the courage to lift your hand, maybe, maybe you didn't have the strength to do it, can we, can we just bow our, bow our heads and close our eyes? And can we just pray this prayer as a family, as friends tonight? Dear Lord, I believe in you. I believe you came to this earth for me. I believe you died for me so that I could live for you. Thank you for your friendship. And today I accept. From this day forward, you are my friend, you are my savior, and you are my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're one that says, I've got some experiences in my life that I just just can't get over. The hurt was too big. The betrayal was too much. The lies were just too much to get over. Can I invite you down to this altar today? We've got prayer partners that are ready and willing to pray with you because I believe that there's safety in friendship. We can find refuge in friendship. When we're friends with Jesus, the word says that his name is a strong tower and the righteous run in and we are safe. And so as we transition into this worship song, I just want to pray for us one more time. Father, thank you for not being a distant God. Thank you for being a God that sees every aspect of our life. You see the depth of our heart and you love us the same. Thank you, Father, for providing a safe place in your presence that we can run into and we can be safe, we can be healed, we can be restored, we can be whole again. Thank you for not just being our savior. Thank you for being our friend. Teach us how to live our lives in a way that would draw others to you and would bring your name glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.